stuff. Very well then, my friends. I've got a little exercise uh, here for you today to see whether you would be able uh, to last in the front line as a BMO. Anybody any idea what a BMO is? British medical officer. Not a British medical officer, a battalion medical officer, i.e. a gentleman such as myself. Uh, you can see that I'm wearing a, a, a very, very attractive uh, red rose on the arm there. Anybody any idea where that might have come from? England. It's from England. It's a 50-50 and if you, get, if you say Yorkshire, I will jump down your throat. Uh, Lancashire. Yeah, this is uh, the West Lancashire Division. The little uh, T's that you see on my collar there uh, denote that I am a territorial officer. Yeah? Uh, and essentially at the start of the war, uh, the Royal Army Medical Corps had only been in existence for about 16 years. Uh, it was only founded uh, in 1898 and uh, there was a severe shortage of uh, medical officers and doctors at the beginning of that conflict. So what was needed uh, was a massive expansion of uh, the Royal Army Medical Corps, uh, especially in terms of trained personnel. So they would get an awful lot of civilian doctors who would essentially be plucked uh, from everyday life. Uh, very, very unpopular because, of course, if you remember, it's 1914, 1915. If you're taking a doctor off to the, uh, to the front, what are you doing to his business? Destroying it. There is no national health service. And, and you know, unfortunately, patients will not pay to see a doctor that isn't there. And a lot of uh, practices actually closed, uh, believe it or not, during the war. Many of these uh, civilian doctors that were essentially given hasty military training uh, were commissioned either at the rank of uh, lieutenant and captain and sent out into the front line, found uh, that their job was extremely difficult because unfortunately uh, what it was like to be a doctor in the front line was very very difficult to what it was like being a doctor in uh, in civilian life so just bear that in mind as uh, as we go through this i have in my hand here a, a whole number of cards 10 in fact uh, we're going to need 10 volunteers we can't get 10 volunteers we're going to need 10 voluntolds we got one there good lad Pick your wound and stick it around your neck. Nice. You want to pick a wound? No, you don't want horrifically wounded. Pick a wound, pick a wound. Anyone pick a wound? We're not going to do it to you. Lovely stuff. Patient number two. Oh, a German prisoner who's been basically beaten half to death. Nice stuff. Lovely, lovely. Lovely, lovely there we go. Some more at the back, there we are. This is going to win this war, sir. Don't be hiding at the back there, sir. Lovely stuff. We just need somebody else. Just what? Good man. Right, so we should have 10 patients, my friends. We should have 10 patients. What I would like you to do is to organize yourself from patient one on the end here uh, to patient 10 there. So we're going to have patient two and then patient three. The numbers are running nicely. We've got patient three here, patient four. Forward we come, forward we come, forward we come. Patient five, lovely stuff. Patient six, swap over that way. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Patient seven, excellent. Uh, patient eight, patient nine, and right on the end, patient 10. Lovely stuff. So a whole host of uh, wounds that have been uh, randomly inflicted on you poor people here. It would be the job of a battalion medical officer to sort these men out, to triage them as rapidly as possible. Now the whole point of the triage system is to return those men uh, as quickly as possible to the fighting line. So we've got on the end uh, patient one who is a young British private found in no man's land unable to speak or stand, seems totally unresponsive. Aside from that, no physical wounds at all. Not much to go on. He can't stand up, he can't talk, he cannot do anything. But there, there is apparently nothing wrong with him. Patient two is a German prisoner. Now bearing in mind that you will be accepting German wounded into your hospital. Uh, he has been severely beaten by rifle butts uh, before he surrendered. He's got a broken nose, has lost several teeth and is deep bruising to the eyes. He complains of dizziness and has been sick several times. He's had a good kick in. 
basically. <laughs> Patient three is another British private. He's got a gunshot wound to the forearm. The wound is clean in itself. The bullet has gone right through. So obviously he's been hit at fairly close range. Uh, the entrance wound has been burnt by cordite. But other than that, are you all right? Yeah, really. Deep, that's the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. All right, now then. <laughs> we have a British Lieutenant Colonel a very high-ranking officer serving with the Royal Engineers Signal Section. Uh, this uh, officer, many years of service, has been cavorting about in no man's land and has fallen and sprained his ankle. <laughs> there we go. Oh, like, yeah. Well done. It's, it's another glorious day. Patient 5, a British Lance Corporal who's been shot in the thigh at long range. The leg is broken, but other than being in considerable pain, he's not otherwise wounded. So we've essentially got a broken leg. Patient 6, uh, our private here has sustained three severe gashes to the head from machine gun bullets. So he's covered in blood and he's screaming in pain. Patient seven, British corporal, who's got a severe head wound. Skull's been fractured by shrapnel and he's lost a lot of blood. He's not conscious and his breathing is shallow and irregular. Oh dear. Patient eight, a lieutenant who's been bayoneted in the groin. Might not be one that he's going to tell the grandchildren. Uh, the wound is neat, it's closed, and he's not bloody. So he's basically been bayoneted in the groin, but he's not bleeding. Uh, tired and drowsy, as you would be, but he seems to be in no pain, quiet and cheerful. Patient nine, uh, a British private who's got a slight shrapnel wound to the shoulder. Breathing very heavily, low pulse, suffering from a severe pain in his stomach and intestines, despite the fact he's got a wound in the shoulder. The medical history card, i.e. the little tag that I will write uh, and stick on his, uh, on his jacket, has not been filled in by the stretcher bearers, okay? So a wound in the shoulder. And again, another bloody German prisoner. He's vomiting for his feast this time, coughing and choking, and he's unable to speak. His lips are blue and his face is drawn. Oh dear. So these are the types of casualties, extremely diverse casualties, that will be pouring in to your frontline regimental aid post. And it is my job, or rather, <laughs> guess what? Your job now to sort yourselves out. We'll start at this end. We've got the private uh, who's unable to speak and stand, totally unresponsive, but no physical wounds. But what's wrong with him, do you think? Shell, Shell shock. shock. Shell shock, yeah. What are we going to do with him? And send him back to the front line. Yeah, send him back to the front line. Yeah, you, you may well say that. Nothing wrong. Pull yourself together, man. Yeah. yeah. There's not really anything that we can do for him, is there? Yeah. Not really. So where is he going to be on our list of priorities? Down right down at the end there. Sorry, yeah. there. sorry, Dave. Yeah. So we've now got our German prisoner who's been beaten. Uh, he's got a broken nose and he's lost a couple of teeth. Standing next to him is a British private that's been shot in the arm. Yeah, could be strapped up roughly and sent back out again. Strapped, strapped up roughly, up. maybe. What do we think about this guy? A shot in the arm. Shall we move him up in front of the German? Because the yeah. German's caused a lot of these wounds, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, really we're, here. we're not a charity here, are we, folks? Shall we swap around? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, German, yeah. Deck down. We've got this Lieutenant Colonel who sprained <laughs> yeah. his ankle. Where's he going? Yeah, right. He's going out. Right back at the end of the line. Go on, sir. Sorry. Off he you go. Get the, get the <laughs> uh, not, not especially yet. Yeah, right. What do we think? Uh, before our shell shock victim or after? After. After. Right back. Yeah, Sorry, right. sir. You might be a high ranking officer, but you can get right down. He's really milking this one, isn't it? Uh, we've got a corporal. This is the guy that's been shot in the leg and it's broken his leg. What are we going to do with him? Fix him up, do you think? He's been shot in the leg. He's yes. got a broken leg. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's, All right, send him up then. Send him up, send him up. He's been a bit of a mess. All right, he's been a bit of a... Ah, now, here is the private that's been shot in the head, basically. Scalps ripped open, covered in blood, screaming and shouting. Right, up to, right up to the top. Good, good. Right, well, that seems uh, that seems fair enough, doesn't it? Yeah, making a hell of a lot of a noise. Now, this is our corporal that's got the severe head wound. Even further, right, even further up to the top of the top, right, the top right to the top. top of the line. Lovely stuff, lovely stuff. Uh, we've got this British lieutenant who's uh, been very heroic. He's been uh, bayoneted in the groin but isn't bleeding. Seems all right. Uh, third place. Third place, maybe up there. We're doing well there. Third place. So that's not bad. That's not bad. Uh, what about our guy that's got the slight shrapnel wound but a terrible pain in his stomach? Quite far up. What do we think? Quite far up. Yeah. What do we think, folks? Are we going to stick him in front of our guy that's been bayoneted? Yeah. All right, in front of the bayonet guy. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. 
Excellent. And uh, what about our German prisoner that's vomiting profusely? Just leave him. He's a German. Did you say, oh, you're just a German, mate? That's you. What's wrong with him? He's vomiting profusely. He can't see all the rest of it. Yes. He's been gassed. What do we do with our gas victim? Nothing. Up the top. Up the top. All right, fire him, fire him up to the top then. So am I even ahead of the guy that's... Yeah. Are, are we even ahead of the guy? No. Guy right. moving his, moving, oh, this is, oh, this is controversial. Uh, yeah. We'll move him down then. Move him down a wee bit. What do we think? The guy that's got... But he's got breathing difficulties. He's got breathing difficulties. Yeah. Even though he's a German, are we going to treat him? Well, hey, not, not, not with priority. Not with priority. Yeah, Shall we move him down a bit? Woof, yeah. it's getting tense out there. Yeah. Move him down a bit then. Yeah. Okay. Lovely stuff. All right then, chaps. Are we happy with that then? From right to left, uh, the guy with a severe head wound, the guy that's got three machine gun bullets that have glanced through the scalp, fella that's uh, got the funny stomach pains, German that's been gassed, lieutenant that's been bayoneted, uh, our guy that's got a, a gunshot wound in the forearm, Lance Corporal with a broken leg, German that's got the you know, teeth missing, uh, shell shot guy, and the lieutenant colonel. Happy with that? You see that? Yeah, he's hiding around the back there. I've just got a couple of missing teeth. That must be true. Yeah, surely, yeah. Happy with that one, chaps? Yeah. To say that you've made a mess of that is a bit of an understatement. Yeah. Whilst uh, you've been sort of saying, oh yeah, look after this guy with the severe head wound, guess what? Unfortunately, mate, you do not have a chance. Sorry. So that is you, and that is the most difficult thing that these uh, civilian doctors had to face. The fact that you have to look at a man that you would spend hours, weeks on trying to kindle back to life in a, in a civilian setting and just basically say, yeah, nothing yeah, nothing I can do for him. Because while we have been patching him up, yeah, our lieutenant has died, and our Lance Corporal has died, and our German has died. While we have been trying to put this fella back together, unfortunately, a little bit like Humpty Dumpty, believe it or not. What about our guy that's there? got severe gashes to the forehead. Superficial. Superficial. Absolutely nothing wrong with him. He's had a very, very close miss. And the fact that he's screaming and screaming and screaming should tell you something. He's all right, he's all right isn't he? Absolutely right. He's absolutely fine. So has anybody ever come off the bike and split the head open? Yeah, tiny little wound, hell of a lot of blood. Nothing really wrong with him. Oh dear. What about our British private who's got the uh, pains in the stomach? And the shoulder wound. And the shoulder wound. <laughs> You've actually not done badly with that one. What's, what's wrong with our British private here? Not bleeding internally, dying of a morphine overdose, believe it or not. What would often happen is, if there was a small wound, they'd be given morphine, and then, as a result of that, if that card wasn't filled in on the chest, somebody would give you more, and somebody would give you more, and somebody would give you more, to the point that you're essentially putting our fella to sleep permanently through a small shoulder wound. So you're in for a stomach pumping. Uh, what about our German prisoner who's coughing and vomiting? Can I how do you treat that? There's not much that you can do apart from giving him milk and making him vomit to try and sort of like collect all like the uh, the stuff that's uh, basically gathering in the throat and in the lungs and get him to basically hook it up out of his system before it gets into the kidneys and liver and starts to destroy him internally. There's not very much that we can do. How's our lieutenant died? I mean, he's all right, isn't he? He's not, he's not making a song and dance about being wounded. He's fine, the lad, isn't it? Internal bleeding. Internal bleeding. Yeah, that is unfortunately a problem. Just because there's not lots and lots and lots of blood gushing out of the wound doesn't mean to say that there's not a lot of blood gushing into the wound. And unfortunately, the fact that he's tired and drowsy and like, oh, I'm all right. <laughs> no, you're not all right, unfortunately. What about our patient that's been shot through the forearm? What are we going to do with him? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> We're going to arrest him. How'd you get a cordite burned on a gunshot wound? <laughs> when the pistol's about that far away. Oh, I see. One of those, are we? You come with me, my friend. So he'd be bandaged up and would then be marched off by uh, the regimental police, believe it or not. Our corporal here, who's been shot in the thigh at long range. Who would rather be shot at long range or close range? Long range. Long range. 
Yeah. So when the bullet starts to slow down, it will start to rock up and down through the air like this. So it is essentially corkscrewed its way through your body, rattling around. And it has broken the femur into all sorts of different pieces. A high priority. If this man moves and those bits of bone cut the femoral artery running up the inside of his leg, he's got about two minutes to live. So even though it's just, just a broken leg, he's right up the top of the line as a high priority. What about our German guy here? He's just lost a few teeth. He's a bit dizzy. He's been sick. Concussion, severe concussion, and if that is not treated, he will die of um, cerebral swelling and hemorrhaging. So even though he's a German, that doesn't matter anymore. To men of the Royal Army Medical Corps, that does not matter. You are only an enemy whilst you have a weapon in your hand. This is just an injured man. An injury has absolutely nothing uh, to do with what side you are on, whether you were fighting two minutes before. So he is actually one of our priorities as well. Uh, our poor fella that cannot speak, shell shock, patch him up, send him back home. However, my friends, thanks to you guys, cheers, you've actually caused hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more casualties for me. Brilliant. How? How? We've not treated, job. We've not treated the Lieutenant Colonel who is running the entirety of the communication <laughs> for the battle. Great work, lads. <laughs> well done. So despite the fact uh, that he's you know, got a bit of a gammy ankle, again, a high priority because of not who he is and his rank, but the job that he does. Dispatch riders, signalers, men that are bringing supplies are going to be given priority, however small their wound is, over more seriously injured infantrymen. That is you. Once you're out of the fight, that's that. But well, this man here is an incredibly important figure on the battlefield. Whilst we've been messing around with all this lot here, the entirety of the communications web out there in no man's land has fallen to pieces, and there are now hundreds and hundreds more casualties flooding into that damn put down there. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody think that they'd be able to do this on a daily basis? It's absolutely incredible. A medical officer is never, ever really off duty. A frontline officer uh, can expect uh, maybe three or four hours sleep a day. Uh, and this is essentially what a medical officer would get, maybe two or three hours sleep per day, not at the same time though. Yeah. As the medical officer, you're not only there to look after wounds, you're there to look after everybody's health. You're constantly monitoring the mental health of the men as well. So it is an incredibly uh, difficult job. Out of all of the regiments, all of the corps, all the rest of it in the British Army, the Royal Army Medical Corps and its antecedents has the most Victoria Crosses, believe it or not. The most Victoria Crosses uh, for gallantry in the front line. Uh, in the First World War, uh, Captain Noel Chavas, who was attached to the, uh, the Liverpool Scottish, won two Victoria Crosses, believe it or not, for, for his incredible gallantry. Uh, the most uh, highly decorated soldier in the First World War was a stretcher bearer. Yeah? So when you think about men charging over the top into battle with machine guns, rifles, spare a thought for the poor doctors and their stretcher bearer teams who were going over the top behind them completely unarmed. And this is a little a bit of an insight into the job that they would have had to do. Thank God that none of us here would be called on to do it today. <laughs> Thank you very much, mate. You've been really good for us. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.